and Sean Bowles. Jane Ham and that good girl, that hood girl, straight masterpiece. Teaching, preaching, tearing it up in the city. Got worship on from night to dawn. Spirit falling so heavy. He's good. Amen. Tongues of fire take you higher, man. So good. Amen. Make Benny want to retire, man. He's good. Amen. Get on up and be praising him. So good. Amen. And the band is on that money. Break it down. Spirit hit you. Hallelujah. Spirit hit you. Hallelujah. Spirit hit you. Hallelujah. Cause HSC gonna give it to you. Cause HSC gonna give it to you. Cause HSC gonna give it to you. If you're looking for God, you're in the spot. Don't believe me, just watch. Come on. Don't believe me, just watch. 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 some Jesus in it, looking hip, feeling fresh, or a bazo, get the stretch, strolling, rolling, heading on down to the city, if we show up, it's gonna show up, tighter than a fresh pair of skins, Harry, everybody, so good, everybody amen. in here, Terry, Terry Moore, the preacher, man, so good, amen. you're the last one, alright, so come on up amen. guys, come on up, alright, did we all get enough to eat? Now we're ready. Now we're ready for the word. Praise God. As I as I told you guys, as I told you guys earlier, we're going to be live streaming. Uh, Pastor, you know, is in the hospital, and we we've been praying for Pastor and everything. So, uh, so Pastor, we say hello. We speak to you, healing in the name of Jesus. I know you're watching us right now. So, uh, at this time. I don't know if any of you have watched Chris Wells on, on the internet, but you've seen some clips that we've shown in church and everything, and uh, he's pretty much like our pastor in a lot of ways, and um, I think he's a, a white man locked up in a black man's body, too, as I saw him, as I saw him ministering and everything, and one thing that he says online, and I know he's probably going to tell you, but he says, no white man can sweat like him, like T.D. Jakes. And, you know, we had T.D. Jakes here the other day ministering, didn't we? No, we had, we had Clarence, but he, he was like T.D. Jakes for us. And we've got, uh, we've got Ernie that's going to be ministering in the morning. So, praise God. You guys all come out and hear Ernie. So, uh, but at this time, I'll let Chris introduce himself. But, Chris, come on up. And I tell you, yes, let's give him a warm welcome. I appreciate that so much. No, not yet. Not yet. Maybe afterwards. But let me tell you this. This is what he meant to say. I'm the only white preacher in America that can out-sweat T.D. Jakes, all right? I'm going to be sweating like a pig up here, so don't worry. Everything's fine. I'm going to be okay. But the other thing you need to know about me is I'm the fastest speaking South Carolinian that you'll ever hear in your life, all right? So you're going to have to listen really quickly today. You're going to have to do that real quickly. But I grew up on the Santee Cooper Reservoir down in the, in the low country. Anybody ever been down there? Yeah. The largest, the largest lakes in South Carolina, 177,000 acres. All of my heroes growing up were bass pros. And I mean that literally. Guys would say, you know what, man? Did you see what Roger Staubach said? I'm kind of dating myself. I said, never mind what Roger Staubach did. Did you see what Roland Martin caught? He must have had 30 pounds a day. I love the sport of bass fishing. As a matter of fact, I've got every Bassmaster episode from 1985 to the present on tape. I collect big league Bass Pro cards. It is a sickness with me. In 2004, check this out, the Bassmasters Classic came to South Carolina for the first time. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bassmasters, the Classic is like the Super Bowl of bass fishing. You, you become a millionaire if you win the Classic. I volunteered, they, they said, all right, the Classic is going to be, and they, they announced it. Lake Hartwell, South Carolina, four seconds after they announced it, I was on the phone with my credit card in hand 
offering to pay Bassmasters if they would let me ride in the boat and watch somebody fish. You know you're sick when you want to watch somebody fish and you want to pay for it. Well, I got paired with the guy who won the tournament. His name is Alton Jones, okay? We're sitting there during practice day, and Alton looks at me and he says, Chris, we're thinking about getting a chaplain for the Bassmaster Tour. He said, your name keeps coming up. Would you be interested in being the chaplain? At that point, I tried to look very spiritual. I kind of bowed my head and I said, well, let me pray about that. For two seconds, yes, I'd love to be the chaplain for the Bassmaster Tour. I was born to be. He said, Chris, we can't afford to pay anything. I said, it's perfect. I don't make any money. So here's what happens. I, I teach a Bible study for the pros before the tournament starts. And then I'm just there as a pastor would be. And they have every single problem that, that a church would have. And I do that into addition you know, to being a speaker. But let me tell you how my journey began. When I graduated from college, I went to the first Baptist church of Georgetown, South Carolina to be their youth pastor, okay? How many of y'all have been to Georgetown, South Carolina? Five river systems that run into a bay. I could fish two and a half hours before I went to work every single day. I said, shoot, man, I'm a big-time youth pastor now. I mean, I'm making lots of money. I mean, I'm making $12,000 a year. I'm going to go buy me a bass boat. And so, I don't know if you've bought a bass boat in the last half century but this is 1990. You know, you're going to know what I'm talking about right here. I walked up and I went to Marshall's Marine. And I said, I want to buy that Ranger bass boat right there. The guy looked at me and he said, Son, that boat costs $35,000. I started adding up on my fingers and realized, I ain't going to never own a bass boat in my life. I said, Shoot, I don't need a bass boat. My daddy's got a 14 foot John boat with a 1979 25 horse Johnson motor on it. I will turn that into a bass fishing machine. And so I tore everything off of the boat. I built a deck across the entire boat with a lip about that high. I put the finest carpet that Walmart makes all over that boat, man. You should have seen it. It was sweet, man. And I said, you know what? I don't need one of them poles to lean back up on. I sure ain't going to sit down. I'm a man. I'll stand up and fish all day. Essentially, what I had was a surfboard with a motor on it, okay? If you go set the hook on a bass and you had a partner in the boat, you had to go, hold on, because if you set the hook too hard, it would just flip over. That thing would turn over. You know, I love speaking in South Carolina. Let me tell you why. Because when I go and speak in California, I have to explain to them what the Piggly Wiggly is, okay? I go up to the Piggly Wiggly in Georgetown, South Carolina, and there's a big neon sign on the door. And it says, Sam Pitt Bassmasters Open Bass Tournament. And it was like this. I had an epiphany. A life-changing moment. I said, I'm going to win this bass tournament right here. This is why I'm going to make my move to the pros. So I needed a partner. So I said, you know what? I'm going to need a partner. I'm going to get the right guy. So I surveyed my church, and there was one guy in my church that was perfect. His name was Dean Kane. He wasn't Superman. He was better. He was a marine biologist. I'm thinking, he probably knows every bass by name. He's probably tagged every bass in the river. Man, he probably knows right where they are at any moment. I said, Dean, will you be my partner? He said, I'd love to. Now listen. If you've never fished in a, in a competitive bass tournament, let me explain how it goes. You pull up to the, to the ramp, all right, and the first thing they do is they check your live well. Now, we are fishing on the, we're putting in on the bay, which is, you know, right next to the ocean, and you run up whatever river system you want to fish, okay? There are 150 boats in this open tournament, okay? This is in the heyday of bass fishing. We pull up, we're the smallest boat within 10 miles of the boat ramp, Okay? This is the guy's exact words. You ready? He's checking live wheels. He looks over and he sees my boat and he goes, hey, hey, these boys going shrimping. Let them through. Come on through, boys. I said, sir, we're here for the bass tournament. He made that noise you make when you're not supposed to laugh, but you just can't help it. I mean, he's going to play it. I said, you need to check my live wheel. He goes, I, I looked at my live wheel. My live wheel was a 105-quart igloo cooler. He goes, I don't think so. So I'm embarrassed. I said, shoot, Dean, let's go home. Man, he said, I'm not embarrassed. I'll put this boat in the water. He said, let me put my mask on first. He puts a ski mask on where nobody can recognize him, okay? <laughs> now, Matt, and again, so we're backing in most, you know, all these $150,000 you know, $40, bass boats. Dean's going, how y'all doing? Yeah, we're going to catch him today. going to be a big day. Now, what they do is they assign you a blast-off number. We're number 17, all right? Now, if you've never ridden in a bass boat that has at least a 200-horsepower motor, let me tell you something. You've, you just never lived in your life. And if you do that, you won't want to live anymore. I'm telling you, I'm beat up from where I was the other day. But let me tell you, the first time I ever rode in a bass boat with those pros, it was a guy named Aaron Martins. And I got in the boat with Aaron, 
And I recommitted my life to Jesus four times before we got to the place we're going to fish. It is ungodly how fast those things go. So we're, we're sitting there, we're getting ready, and the guy goes, all right, way is at 3 o'clock. Number one! And number one was right off my right-hand side, okay? And I had no idea. And when he hit the motor, it sounded like this. It went, <laughs> and a big rooster tail came out and just sprayed us. I mean, it just came right across the bow. And I'm sitting there with a tiller handle in the boat, kind of doing like this, you know, just trying to stay in the boat. Number two, he comes from this way. <laughs> blows right across. They keep on going. Number three, I mean the smell of oil is in there. The, the, it's white cap and we're bouncing up and down. They get on down. Number 16. <laughs> number 17. <laughs> I guess about 100 yards from the landing, my boat died. The guy said, you having a problem with that little boat out there? Dean stands up. He's still got his ski mask on. He goes, no, we're going to fish right here. I mean, it's bouncing. We are in the Georgetown shipping channel at this point. We finally, I tell you, we finally get the boat cranked. We get where we're going to fish. And I pick up my flipping stick, and I'm flipping and pitching. And I promise you, I don't turn around until about 12 o'clock. When I turn around, the marine biologist, who's supposed to know every bass by name, he's got an RC cola in this hand and a bologna and cheese sandwich in the other. He said, this is the biggest redneck sport I've ever seen in my life. I was like, we're in a John boat. Our live wheel's a cooler. We're like, rednecks are us type of deal. I said, Dean, let's just go home. Nobody will ever know we were in the tournament. We will sneak away. Nobody will ever know. He said, that's fine by me. So we took off to the hill. We come back in. We're trying to sneak in. We put in. I get up on the dock, and the guy goes, hey, hey, y'all in early. You need a bag to weigh your fish? I said, we've been shrimping all day, man. What are you talking about? We're not in the tournament. So I go up to my truck, and I can't believe my eyes because my youth group has been there. They have wrapped my entire truck in saran wrap. Let me tell you right now, I know pastors have rough. I know the pastor's watching. You need to pray for the pastor. But I want to tell you something. The most persecuted people in Christianity are not over in other countries. They're youth pastors. You don't believe that? That whole thing was wrapped in saran wrap. And there was a big sign that said, Bassmaster Champion Chris Wells. It was probably the most embarrassing day of my life, i got to tell you. But I'm going to tell you one more story. And the reason I'm going to tell you this story today is because there, there are very few ladies here, Okay. I love talking to men, and I'll tell you why I love talking to men, but one of the reasons I love talking to men is I can tell stories that I can't tell around ladies, so ladies, I'm going to have to apologize to you all for this story, but when I was a youth pastor, I found out I'm not a very good counselor, okay, and that's what a pastor has to do. A pastor, y'all don't have to leave, no, this is good, it isn't that bad, come on, it's all right. <laughs> I just ran the ladies out, man, that's a good way. Okay, so here's the thing, what was I talking about, I'm ADD, oh yeah, so here's what happens, all right, when I was a youth pastor. A, a, a pastor, a guy on a church staff, has to do a lot of different hats. That's where a lot of hats. He has to be able to preach and teach. And sometimes you have to be able to counsel with people that are in need. Well, I found out I'm not a very good counselor. This is how I found out. One day this guy comes in. It's a Friday, and I was the only one that ever worked on Friday. I was a staff member that worked on Friday. So I'm in there on Friday, and uh, this guy comes in. I can tell he's visibly upset, and his name is Billy. And he sits down, and I said, um, Billy, what's wrong? And I put my little non-anxious counseling face on, you know. And he goes, well, Brother Chris, let me tell you. He said, and I can tell he's shaking. I said, I said, what in the world, man? You just calm down. It's okay, Billy. He said, well, my wife, Luann, ran in tonight in a panic. She said, Billy, there's a giant animal in our backyard. He said, I jumped up, and he said, Brother Chris, it was the biggest wild boar I've ever seen in my life. He said, son, the thing had tusks sticking out of his mouth. The hair was sticking up on it. He said, I ran and got my hunting regulations book. He said, I flipped it open. I said, oh, oh, yeah, baby, we're going to eat pig tonight, baby. He said, I grabbed my 9 millimeter pistol, okay, the one with the 16-shot capacity, all right? He runs out on the back deck. Now, I don't know if you've ever touched a hog before, but if you touch a hog, it sounds like it's going to die, much less if you're actually trying to make it die. He shoots this hog in the hind quarters. He said, I broke both of his legs on the first shot. He said, it just went poof like that. He said, but it wouldn't die. He said, now it's just spinning. It's going, wee, wee. He said, it's just going, he's just spinning around like that, around, around. He said, I shoot it again. He said, it won't die. He said, now blood is going, woo. We were like a fountain. He said, this boy. He said, I shoot again. He said, now the neighbors are coming out going, what in the world's going on out here? What's happening? He said, I meant, he said, it won't die. He said, I shoot it again. And he said, there's a knock on our door. Every word of this story is true. You ready? You're going to think I'm lying when I tell you this. He said, there's a lady there we've never seen before in our life. She said, ma'am, we just moved into your neighborhood. Our pet pot belly pig just got loose. <laughs> He said, I'm on shot number five right now. <laughs> when you get together with his wife, his wife said the moment that lady said that, she heard Billy go, boom, like that. And she was like, you know, what the world? He said, now let me tell you, in this point in the story, 
Billy has got tears coming down his sand. I, I am in the floor laughing so hard, I can't catch my breath. I know I'll tell this story the rest of my life. He starts kicking me. He goes, Brother Chris, it's not funny. He said, not only did I not eat pig, I had to do a funeral service for the pig. <laughs> Man, I love my life. I cannot wait to see what happens next. I mean, it's around the corner. But I want to tell you something, guys. I didn't come here today just to tell you funny stories. So up to this point, you're going, this dude's just a comedian, man. That's all he's going to do, man. We, we got the wrong speaker in here today. But I believe that God brought me here for a reason, and I believe he brought you here for a reason. And let me tell you, I was going to tell the ladies, this is the reason I like to talk to men, okay? Statistics tell us this, that if you reach a child for Christ, there's a 4% chance that child's entire family will start coming to your church. If you reach a woman for Christ, there's a 17% chance that woman's entire family will start coming to your church. But if you reach a man for Christ, there's a 94% chance that man's entire family will start coming to church. Women have carried our churches for the last 40 years. And it's time for men to step up to the plate. So here's what I'm going to get you to do. I don't know you. It may be that every single man in here is a praying person, all right? But even if you're not, I'm glad you're here. But this is what I'm going to invite you to do. I'm going to invite you to pray this morning. This is what I want you to pray. God, if you have anything to say to me, I will listen. Will you do that? This means yeah. All right, let's pray together. Pray with me. Father God, I love you, and I thank you for the opportunity to be in this place today. But Father, we didn't come here today to hear a message from a man. We came to hear a message from you. And I pray, Lord, that if you've got anything to say to us, that we would listen. That if you've got anything you want us to do, we would do it. If you want us to respond to you in any way, we would respond. We would not hesitate. We would not back down. But we would be the men that you have called us to be. As we look in your word, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. In the book of Daniel chapter 5, there's an interesting story. Now let me tell you, some, I'm going to talk from the Old Testament today. But in the Old Testament, there's a cycle that happens over and over again. You can open up the Old Testament and point, and the, and the Israelites are somewhere in this cycle that I'm going to tell you about. The people in a right relationship with God, they sin against God. God brings judgment upon them. They repent. God puts them back into a right relationship. That's what happens. It happens over and over. And no matter where you are, this cycle happens over and over and over again. And the passage that I'm going to share with you today, it comes out of the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, God has brought judgment upon the Israelites in the form of the Babylonians. And a couple of kings come to power. And finally, a king comes to power named Belshazzar or Belshazzar. And I want to challenge you to listen to this today. Because let me tell you, I grew up going to church. Thought I was a Christian because I believed in God, and I'd walk down the church aisle and taken a pastor by the hand. But it wasn't until my sophomore year in college, I went to a fraternity party dressed as the Tom Cruise character that he played in the movie Top Gun. You remember that movie? I know what you're thinking right now. Going, you going to do? I used to have a six pack. Now I got a two liter. But here, anyway, that night I got real low, and I laid under a pecan tree, and I said, Jesus, if you'll forgive my sins and come into my life, I will follow you. And I can't prove it to you, but Jesus changed my life. And, and, and let me tell you, I didn't believe at that time that, that God could really speak to me through the Bible, but I believe that God speaks to us. And so I want to share with you this story, and I believe this story has as much relevance today as it ever has in life. This king I'm going to tell you about is a man who has every, absolutely everything. As a matter of fact, he has everything that America tells a man that they need to have in order to be happy in life. Let me prove that to you. When Belshazzar walks down the street. He is a man that never has to introduce himself to anyone. Why? Because everybody knows who he is. Imagine living a life like that. Imagine living a life that no matter where you go, everybody knows who you are. And on top of that, he has what every single man wants in life. I know whether you want to admit it or not, whether you want to believe it, but every single man in this room, every single man you ever meet, what we want more than anything else in the world we want other men to respect us for who we are and what we do, don't you? Don't you know that? You know when you're, when you're a fisherman, you want, to know, you want all the other captains to know, I'm the best guy out here on the deal. I use, I'm the good guy. You know, when you're a Marine, you want to be the best Marine. When you, whatever it is you do, you want other men to say, hey, you know what? I respect him. I respect what he does. Belshazzar's got that. Belshazzar, when he walks down, he never has to walk up to somebody and say, hey, how you doing? My name is Belshazzar. Everybody knows who he is. And when he walks in the room, everybody does this. Imagine that, man. Imagine everybody, every man you know, when you walk into him, not only do you know you, he bows right there. Because he knows he's the king. He's got power, he's got respect, and he's got fame. Let me tell you what else he's got. 
The Bible says he has money. Money. We learn from this passage, I'm going to share with you, that Belshazzar drinks from gold and silver goblets. I don't know how it is at your house, but we don't drink from gold and silver goblets at my house. We drink from solo cups. I mean, that's what we do. Plastic cup, that's our house. That's about as expensive as we're going to get in my house. Belshazzar drinks from gold and silver. Imagine living a life where you didn't have to want for anything. And, and imagine living a life where anything you wanted, you got it right then. Tell me that's not the American dream. I mean, everybody wants to be able to walk in the store and go, hey, Bass Pro Shop, yeah, give me that one. No, give me two of those right there. And you get right in. See, I don't know how your life is lived, but my life is lived like this. If I want something, I have to save for it. Does anybody else live a life like that? And then this is what happens. I save and I save and I save. And right before I go to buy it, something in my house breaks, and I have to spend that money on that. Does anybody else live that life? Yeah. I know exactly where you are. Belshazzar's not like that at all. Belshazzar's got everything he wants when he wants. Let me tell you what else he's got, guys. He's got women. Not woman. Women. Plural. The Bible says he has wives, plural, and concubines. Now, wives is one thing. But let me tell you about the concubine situation. Here's the concubine. In case you don't know what a concubine is, this is what it means, all right? It means this, that if Belshazzar's walking down the street and he sees a woman he's interested in, he didn't have to woo her. He didn't have to tell her good lines. He didn't have to be charming. All he has to do is say, yeah, see that one? Yeah, bring her to me. Man, this guy's got everything. I mean, he's got the American dream down pat. I mean, he's got power, money, respect, women. He's got it all. And one day in the book of Daniel, this king decides to throw a little soiree. He's going to throw a little party. As a matter of fact, the Bible says a thousand of his lords and nobles gather together for this party. That probably means there's probably 3,000 people there. They didn't count women in those days. And so I'm going to paraphrase this for you, but it's in James chapter 5. This is what it says. Okay? It says that Belshazzar throws a party, and he looks around at the people in the party. He says, i tell you what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to have my servants... Bring in the gold and the silver goblets that my ancestor Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple of Jehovah. And I'm going to have everyone in the room, everyone, think about that. That's over a thousand people. Drink from a gold and silver goblet. He claps his hands. The servants come in, hand everybody a gold or a silver goblet. And they are drinking wine, and they are buzzing, and they are having a party, and everything is going great until a sobering moment occurs. Do you know what I mean by a sobering moment? Let me put it in my vernacular. One time I was on Lake Watery, South Carolina, and I knew I was going to win the tournament. I was, on the, I was on the winning fish. Problem was, I had my 25 horsepower on my boat. Jack had 150 horsepower on his. When I got to my fishing spot, Jack was already there. He was there 30 minutes before I got there. And I remember he, when, I, when I was riding up, he's got a bass on a DD-22 crankbait. And I could see that bass. It's a big one. It's a three-pounder. And it's wide. And he's, he's laughing. I can tell. And he scoops that fish. I remember he reached in there and grabbed that fish. And he picked it up. And he said, hey, Chris, check this out. Like that. And I was mad as a hornet. And I remember at that moment, that fish shook his head and drove the treble hook through the bone of Jack's thumb. I've never seen one go in this bad. I mean, all the color drained out of his face. I mean, it was gone. And I said, Jack, are you okay? And Jack went, no, just like that. It's kind of cool because Jack had to go to the hospital and I won that tournament. But anyway, here's what happened. A sobering moment occurred, all right? Belshazzar is sitting there drinking and partying, and the Bible says all of a sudden something that looks like a hand appears and writes in the plaster of the wall in a language that nobody can understand. Now, as the Bible records it, it's like a Scooby-Doo episode. Okay, you ever seen the old Scooby-Doo cartoons when people get scared, Shaggy gets scared, and he starts saying, the Bible says he is so afraid his knees begin to knock together. He is absolutely undone. And he's sitting there, and you can imagine the whole place gets quiet. And let me tell you, I don't advocate anybody start drinking in here, but if you are drinking and a hand appears, that's your clue to stop drinking right there. Everybody sobers up the room, you know, and everybody's sitting there looking and finally, Belshazzar, who is shaking visibly, says, can anybody tell me what just happened here? Can anybody tell me what these words mean? Can anybody tell me? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make you the third highest ruler in my kingdom. If you can just tell me what these words mean, nobody can. Finally, the, the queen speaks up. They bring in the you think I, I know what you're doing. You're bringing me like a, a towel, aren't you, man? But let me tell you, there's always a great guy or lady in the, in the church that always... Uh, 
either brings me a glass of water or something like that. But I warned you, you know, I'm, I'm a sweater, so that's his deal. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. And so all of a sudden, what happens is, you know, this, this, uh, this whole situation, you know, comes into fruition where Belshazzar sees this, and he is absolutely undone. The queen speaks up, and she goes, there's a Hebrew boy. His name is Daniel. He can tell you what the words mean. And he, you know, they bring Daniel in. And Daniel looks around, and he gives Belshazzar a history lesson. And then he tells him what the words mean. The words were this. Mine, mine, tinkle, parson. Mine, God has numbered the days of your reign. And today, he has brought it to an end. Tinkel, you have been weighed on the scales. And you have been found wanting. I know a lot about that as being a bass fisherman, let me tell you. Parson, tonight your kingdom will be divided among the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar claps his hands. They bring in a, the, 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 a gold and, and, and purple robe. They put gold chain around his neck. They put a purple robe over him. And they declare him the third highest ruler in the kingdom. The next verse, verse 62, says this. That night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over his kingdom at age 62. I know what you're thinking right now. You're going, what in the world does this story have to do with me in 2016 today? Let me tell you, I'm going to give you some principles to live by as a man today. Number one is this. Don't be flippant with the things of God in your life. Don't be flippant with the things of God. Belshazzar took the holy things dedicated to God, and he used them in a flippant manner. You go, wait a minute, Chris. We don't have gold and silver goblets from the temple of Jehovah. Let me tell you what we do have. Let me tell you what this generation of men has. Okay? This generation of men has been given things that no other generation got, but they long to have. Did you know that the Bible is more available now than any other time in our history? And the Bible is unlike any other book that's ever been written. A number of years ago, my wife read the vampire books. You remember that? The Twilight series. You remember that? I never met a single woman ever that read those books and said, you know what? When I read those books, it was like God was speaking to me. It was like he was saying, be a vampire, be a vampire. Thank you, brother. Wow, he's doing good, man. Can you get me a towel next? That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, be, like, be a vampire. Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever reads the, the book Treasure Island and thinks that God is calling them to be a pirate. But countless people throughout the ages read the Bible and say it was like God was speaking to me. And it's not just one generation, it's generation after generation. Why is that? Because the Bible is the primary way God chooses to speak to our hearts. But yet, even though the Bible is more available today, and let me tell you, if you don't have a Bible, it's your fault. It is. Let me give you a couple options. If you don't have a Bible, if you've got a smartphone, you can download every version of the Bible that exists for free. Did you know that? You know that if you don't have a Bible, the next time you go to a motel, you go on vacation, Take the Bible. Steal it. You go, dude, I met a preacher today that told me to steal a Bible out of a motel. Unbelievable. You know what will happen if you take a Bible out of a motel? A Gideon will magically appear like a gnome and put it right back. That's what they do. That's what they live for. But even though the Bible is more available in any other time in our history, it's less read now than any other time in our history. How do you know that, Chris? Because if men read it, it would change the way we live our lives. It would change the way we live. We know we're supposed to read it. We know that we should read it. We just don't do it. We're flippant with the things of God. We have been given the very words of God, and this generation doesn't know the word of God. Don't be flippant with things. Let me tell you what else we got. This generation has been given the greatest news of any generation. There is no news greater that you could share with anyone than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest news of all of history that God became a man. And when we could not save ourselves, He did it for us. It's unbelievable. And yet, in my denomination, they say 95% of my denomination will never share their faith even one single time with the greatest news. And yet, I'm looking out in the room right here. I'm seeing a dude with a South Carolina baseball cap on. I'm seeing a dude with a Clemson Tiger thing over here. Let me tell you, man, I got a buddy of mine. He is 52 years old. This, this year, in a couple weeks, it'll be Saturday, he will wake up, paint half of his face garnet and half of his face black. He will go out to his giant garnet and black pickup truck, the one that has the giant chicken flag on the back of it. 
And it, I mean, he don't go out with them little ones. He's got one that goes, whoa, 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 like that. When South Carolina scores, he goes absolutely ballistic. My associate pastor, he thinks there's nothing more deeply religiously moving than to watch the Clemson Tigers bounce down that hill. I mean, there's a stain in my rug right now where one day he was over at my house and he got so excited when they ran down the hill, he knocked over a tray and this picante sauce all over my thing to this day. Do you know what football is, guys? Look at me. Football is 11 guys trying to take a piece of pig skin and put it over a line more than those 11 guys can. And we go crazy over it. We go absolutely ballistic. We stand up and we declare our allegiance. We wear our colors. We fire our flags. And we let everybody in the country know, this is my team. You ain't, I mean, you, Michigan, Ohio State, it doesn't matter where you are. Everybody declares. And yet, we won't tell anybody about who saved us from death and hell. Guys, let me tell you, that's flippant. That's taking something that's precious and absolutely treating it. Flippant. Let me tell you what else. There are guys that hear the gospel over and over again. I see it all the time. And this is what they think. And they think, you know what? I'll get religious later in my life. I'll come to know God later in my life. And God speaks to their heart. And they said, you know what? I, I'm just not ready now. I'm just not ready to do that right yet. Let me tell you, don't be flippant with the voice of God. Don't be flippant with the things of God. Make the things of God the priority in your life. And when, you, when that priority gets right, every other priority will come where every other priority needs to be. Don't be flippant with the things of God. Number two, okay, you ready for this? Hey, if you guys are 18 years old or below, okay, I really want you to pay attention to this. I see a couple of you young guys in the back back there. Listen to this one. Learn from the mistakes of those that have gone before you. Learn from the mistakes. You know that man makes the same mistakes over and over. If you would have taken a, you would have taken a Belshazzar and said, you know what, dude? Darius the Mede, you know, is outside the gate, okay? But your ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar, he tried God. And he was flippant with the things of God. And God brought judgment upon him. And God made him eat out of a field like a mule. Maybe he would have decided, you know what? I don't need to do this. Maybe I, maybe I need to be careful. I need to look at my history. But they don't do that. You know what, guys? Men make the same mistakes. Let's just do a little test right here. You do a little test. How many men in here know some man in your life? I'm just going to keep my hand up, all right, whose life has been ruined by alcohol. Anybody? Raise your hand. Let me see you. How about divorce? Anybody? Pornography? Anybody? Drugs? Anybody? I mean, I mean it happens over and over and over again. How many of y'all have ever seen, like, a teenager during, like, a graduation time? How many of y'all ever had in this community had a teenager that got into a car I didn't been drinking and driving and got killed during that. Anybody know that? That happens over and over. Every year I can ever remember, that happens somewhere in this state over and over. Why? Because we don't learn from mistakes. Let me tell you what you do if you're younger in here. Find somebody that's got a little gray in their hair or maybe no hair at all. Find somebody that's got a little gray in their beard and ask them this question. Sir, are there things that you did wrong in your life that you could tell me about that could keep me from making the same mistakes? How many of you guys got a little gray in your hair could offer some advice like that? Raise your hand. Let me see. Look at that. I didn't even rehearse that with them. But you know what? They never do that. I remember when I was a young man, this is it. Now listen, I know you're sitting there and you're young. You're thinking, he's just picking on me. And all the older people are going, hey, man, that's right. I'm going to get to the older guys in just a second. Let me see. Here we go. So here's the thing. So when I was a kid, this was my mentality, okay? I was 18 years old, and I knew everything. I knew it all. I was, I was close to omnipresent. I mean, I really was. I was everywhere. I knew everything. I remember my daddy saying, you need to be doing this. I'm like, old man, you're in the grave, man. You're 38 years old, man. Old man, you ain't nothing. You know about fun? I'm having fun, man. I'm fun, old man. Ain't got no hair, old man. I mean, that's the way I thought, okay? When I got to be about 21 years old, I realized my dad wasn't as stupid as I thought he was. And when I got to be about 30, I realized he was just flat brilliant. And I should have done a whole lot of things. Learn from mistakes that was before you. Now, guys, older guys, you ready? This is going to hurt you. You ready? You know why those guys don't do that? Because you don't disciple them. Because you don't disciple them. Our generation does not do what the Great Commission says. We think we do. And we love, my, my denomination loves to talk about the, the Great Commission. They love that. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But they never, ever talk about the next part of that verse. You know what the next part of that verse says? It says, teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. We are woefully ignorant in teaching people what to obey. Why is that? 
because we made discipleship to be at this big guru thing. You go, well, man, Chris, I don't have a Bible degree, man. I didn't go to seminary, man. I don't know everything about the Bible. You know what? To disciple a young person, you don't have to know everything. You just got to know a little more than what they know. You know what discipleship is? It's a guy, Jesus, and he's walking beside a lake, and he tells a bunch of fishermen, says, you guys follow me. You do what I do. You watch what I do, and then you do it. And when you mess up, I'm going to fuss at you. That's discipleship. It's when you take a group of young men, and you say, guys, let me tell you, I'm going to show you how to pray. I'm going to show you how to walk. I'm going to show you what to read in the Bible. I'm going to show you how to do it. And when you mess up, I'm going to show you how to share your faith with other people in the right way to do it, okay? And when you mess up, I'm going to fuss at you. That's discipleship. Guys, let me tell you, we desperately need to learn from mistakes that go on for us. Next one, you ready for this one? Realize one day, your story is going to come to an end. It's going to come to an end. One day your story's going to come to an end. I know what you think, man. If you're 18 or above, below, you're like, man, that's a long time from now, man. That's what I used to think. I used to think, man, that's forever. Let me tell you, do this. Find those people with gray in their hair and no hair at all and ask them this question. Say, is your life dragging on or is it going by pretty quickly, okay? You won't meet a single man ever in your life that says, you know what? My life is just going on and on. It's like I'm living forever. It's like it's never going to end. I mean, it just keeps going and going and going. You know what every single one of them will say? They'll say, I was your age yesterday. I can remember what it smelled like in my mom's car when I first started driving. It was like a whisper. The Bible even says, it says your life is like a vapor. It means it's like your breath. When you walk outside, when it's cold and you see your breath for a second, it's there for a second and it's gone just like that. It's just like that. You need to understand one day your story's going to come to an end. I know you still don't believe me. Let me tell you, if you ever go on my website, there's a, uh, there's a, web, there's a picture of me holding two big old bass. Okay, and uh, it's a seven pounder in my right hand and a five pounder on my left hand, and I caught those fish on back to back cast at Lake Murray. Okay, and a buddy of mine took a picture. He was my partner. His name is Sam Odom. Okay, and Sam and I, you know, won a tournament on Lake Murray together one time, a Fishers of Men tournament. You know, just an awesome kid, one of the most, one of the, the best, well mannered kids I've ever met in my life. Just live life to the fullest. And about seven years, seven or eight years ago, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And about, I guess, 5 o'clock in the morning, somebody called me. And they said, Chris, I hate to tell you this, man, but Sam Odom was just killed in a car crash. He, he did what a lot of kids do. He, he you know, made a mistake, got into a bunch of kids that were drinking, and the kid overcorrected. He ran off the road and overcorrected and came over and hit a culvert, and the car flipped and clipped a tree, and the tree fell right on top of Sam and just crushed him right there. He died instantly. 17 years old. I went to Sam's funeral. And I, I, about 2,000 people came to this kid's funeral. I got there five and a half hours early, and I almost didn't get in. But this is what I hear. It's not just with Sam. It's with anybody. This is what I hear a lot. It's not fair. It's just not fair, man. It's not fair that a 17-year-old dies. It's not fair that a 16-year-old dies. It's not fair that a young person dies. It's just not fair. Y'all look up at me. It is fair. It is fair. Let me tell you why it's fair. Because God does not promise anything anyone tomorrow no one from the youngest person in this room to the oldest person here God says you have today you have today but yet we live our lives as if we have the right to live our life like God owes us something he owes us a big long life and God says no I give you right now and what you do with me right now is what matters so what do you do Chris you write a good chapter to your story today if you've got a bad story going on in your life, you need to write a good chapter to your story today. You need to move and you need to, to act and you need to obey what God is telling you to do today because one day your story is going to come to an end. I was preaching in North Carolina, preaching this exact same message. And a guy, it was a, it was a, it was a fishing outreach tournament. And I remember the, the next day, the guy that won the tournament caught 28 pounds on car reservoir and that's never happened before. He's fishing by himself. i never forget the look on that guy's face. He held up those fish, and they were taking pictures of him, and he knew he's going to blow the tournament away. And I remember he put the fish in the bag, took two steps off the podium, and collapsed right there. They worked on him for 45 minutes, and he died right there. I will guarantee you that when he was holding those two fish up, the last thing on his mind is I'm not going to make it to there before I enter eternity. Right there. Let me tell you something. You need to write a good chapter to your story today. I meet a lot of people that say, boy, you know what, I'll do that later. 
or I'll get, you know, I'll get right with God, you know, some other time. I got a lot of living to do. Let me tell you something. There's an old Jewish proverb. A guy comes up to a Jewish rabbi and says, Rabbi, when is the best possible time to repent? And the rabbi thought a minute. He said, well, I guess right before you die would be the best possible time. He said, what if I don't know when I'm going to die? He said, well, you better repent today. Let me tell you something. We need to repent. We need to do it today. Last thing I'm going to tell you today. You ready for this one? Without spiritual purpose in your life, your life will mean absolutely nothing. Belshazzar had everything. He had everything. He had his retirement plan. He had his life locked out. He didn't have a financial care in the world. He had everything planned in, in just one second. Everything that he planned on. Everything that he fretted over, everything that he thought he had secure, everything that he strived for, in just one second, look at me, guys, it was given to his sworn enemy, Darius and me, just like that. Without a spiritual purpose in your life, your life will be just like that. Without a spiritual purpose in your life, it will mean absolutely nothing. You go, wait a minute, Chris, you don't know me. My family's important, man. They're going to name that bridge after my family. Well, you know what's going to happen when that bridge gets old? They're going to tear it down and they're going to name it after somebody else. The other day, there's a, there's a friend of mine, his name is Marty Stone. This just popped into my head. He told me a story. Marty, at one time, was ranked number one in the world by BassFan.com. He was number one in the world. He retired a couple years ago, and he became the host for a new show called Major League Fishing. Y'all ever watch Major League Fishing? It's the best show on television. You need to watch it. It's unbelievable. It's an awesome show. And the other day, he said, Chris, I was standing in line. And he said, a kid looked up at me and he said, hey, you're Marty Stone. You're the host of Major League Fishing. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, you like to fish right here? Yeah. He goes, yeah, I fished right here when I used to fish Bassmaster. He said, the kid went, you used to fish Bassmaster? He said, the first 25 years of my life were wasted. Nobody knows what I did. Nobody has a clue. And you know what? Without a spiritual purpose in your life, your life will mean absolutely nothing. It will mean nothing. You say, well, Chris, you know, what do you mean, man? What do you mean get a spiritual purpose in your life? Let me tell you something. There are a lot of men today that honestly believe life is about making enough money so they can get to a great retirement, so they can just enjoy life. And that is not what life is about. That is not the purpose of life. There are a lot of men that sit in churches. Now listen to this one. They have no idea what the spiritual gifts are, much less what their particular spiritual gift is. You mean to tell you what, 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 I ask people this all the time, I say this. I say, what are you doing right now that in 10,000 years is going to matter? There's only one thing you can do, and that is the will of God. The will of God in your life will matter in 10,000 years. If you obey the will of God, it will matter. You say, well, Chris, what is the will of God for my life? I can only tell you that up to a point, all right? And I believe this. Now, a lot of theologians in today's theological climate won't make this statement, but I will make this statement. I believe that it is God's desire for you to have a personal relationship with His Son. To know his son Jesus. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. There are a lot of people that know about Jesus. There are a lot of people in this world that, that they, they know that Jesus was you know, supposedly God and came and, and lived a life and, and died on a cross and they, they might even believe in Jesus. But there's a difference in believing in Jesus and knowing Jesus. There's a friend of mine, his name is Adrian Dupre. Adrian is probably one of the most powerful speakers on our planet today. Adrian said that he called up a man named Dr. T.W. Hunt. It's rumored that T.W. Hunt would wake up every morning at 4 a.m. and pray till noon every single day. He authored a book called The Mind of Christ. He is one of the most godly men that I've ever heard of in history. Okay? He said, Dr. Hunt, is it possible that someone can go to church their entire life and spend an eternity separated from God? He said, T.W. Hunt began to weep over the phone. He said when he finally composed himself, this is what he said. He said, he said, Chris, he said Adrian, I believe as much as 80% of the church today is lost without Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that scares me to death. But it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because it makes sense why men who go to church have no power over sin in their lives. How we can say we love Jesus at church, but we go home and our families see a totally different person. How we can say we love Jesus at church and we go to work and nobody ever knows that we love Jesus. How we can say we love Jesus but we never talk to him about anything. We'll talk about anything in the world except what he did in our lives. Why is that? Because there are a lot of men that know about Jesus. But they don't know Jesus. The other day I was in preaching in a church and we got on a, an elevator. I was with a youth pastor. We got on an elevator and we're going up to the sanctuary. And a lady had a walker. 
And I remember he looked at her and he said, Miss Brown, are you going up? And she said, boy, I sure hope I'm going up. That's what she said. And we kind of chuckled like that. But I took two steps off that elevator and I turned around. I said, Miss Brown, let me tell you something. You don't have to hope you're going up. The Bible says, I write these things to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible says you don't have to hope you're saved. You don't have to wonder if you're saved. The Bible says you can know you're saved. I believe it's God's will that you be saved. The second part of this is this. If you are saved in here, let me tell you what God's will is for your life. Your, God's will for your life, I can say for certain, is not just to make a lot of money to get a good retirement and just do whatever you want to. God's will for your life is that the moment that He saves you, He gifts you. He puts His Spirit inside of you and He gives you a gift. The gift is something that only you can do by the grace of God. Your purpose is to find out what that gift is and use that gift for His glory. That's your purpose in life. To find out what your spiritual gift is and use it for the glory of God. Let me ask you something, guys. Where are you here today? Are you flippant with the things of God? Do you learn from the mistakes of those who have gone before you? Have you written a good chapter to your story? And do you have a spiritual purpose in your life? There is nothing greater than this. And let me, tell you, let me share it with you just very plainly. People ask me all the time, they say, Chris, what in the world do I have to do to be saved? Let me tell you what it means to be saved. This is what it means. It means that the Spirit of God has convicted you of your sin. And see, I always invite people to pray to, to receive Christ. But let me tell you something. It's not just a prayer that saves us. All right? If it was a prayer, I would run through the streets and say, would you just pray this prayer? Would you just pray this prayer? But the Bible says this. The Bible says that when God's Spirit convicts us, He, he convinces us. To convict means He convinces us. Well, we're sitting in there and we hear the Word of God and we know He is talking to us. He convicts you of your sin. Then that's your indication to do an old-fashioned word. It's an old-fashioned word that you don't hear a whole lot in churches anymore. It's called repent. To repent means this. It means if you're walking towards your sin, you stop. And you turn away from your sin, and you turn towards God. Because God is always 180 degrees from sin. Okay, So you turn away from your sin, and you turn towards God. And by faith, you trust what Jesus did for you on the cross. By faith. Let me show you what I mean by faith. I don't know. Do these, these chairs hook together? Let me do, let me do it over here. I got one right here, all right? A lot of people believe that faith is this, okay? They believe that faith is, you know what? I believe that that chair will hold me up. I believe it will. I honestly believe in my head that if I sat on that chair, it would hold me up. And most people think that is faith. That's not faith. Faith is this. It's when I say, I believe that chair will hold me up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in it. And I'm going to put the weight in that chair. And I'm going to rely, I'm going to trust that chair completely. Faith in Christ means to have a weight-bearing trust. It means you take your life and you give it to Him. And you say, I trust you. I trust you. And the Bible says that when that happens, it is such a radical experience, it's like being born again. It's the most important decision anybody can ever make. So I don't know where you are here today, so I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. We're going to end in a word of prayer, but if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, let me tell you the awesome news. The awesome news is He's here tonight. If you're out here and you're watching on TV, the Bible says where two or more gathered in my name, there will I be also. He's here. If you're here and you've never trusted Him before, I'm going to invite you to do that today. I'm going to invite you to trust Him. You say, well, Chris, I don't know how to do that. Well, I'm going to invite you to pray. Now, you just told us, Chris, a prayer doesn't save us. Prayer is how we communicate with God. You feel God speaking to your heart, and he's telling you, I'm talking to you, and I want you. I want you to trust me today. Would you trust him? You say, well, I don't really know how to pray. You can pray something like this. Would you pray it in your heart silently? Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I realize that right now. I realize I can't have eternal life without you. Jesus, I believe you're God's son. I believe you died on the cross for me, and I believe you rose again. And right now, the best I know how, I turn from my sins with your help. And I trust what you did for me on the cross to pay for my sins. And I invite you to come into my life and save me. Would you save me, Lord Jesus? Would you come into my life right now and save me? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to make you get up here. But I do want to pray for you. 
I wonder how many people say, Chris, you know what? I just prayed that prayer and I meant it with my whole heart. Would you pray for me? We'll do it on the count of three. You just slip your hand up real quick and I'll pray for you. You can put it down. You ready? Is that you? Ready? One, two, three, go. I see one. I see two. Anybody else? Okay, you can put them down. Chris, I'm here today and I'm born again. I know if I was to die, I'd go to be with Jesus. But I've been flippant with the things of God. I walked away from Him. I let sin come in, in my life and separate my fellowship with God. And I just kind of thought I came to eat breakfast here today, but I know God brought me here to bring me back. If that's you, would you pray right now? Would you pray, Lord Jesus, I confess my sins to you, and I ask you to put me in a right relationship with you. And from this moment on, I follow you, Lord. I'm sorry for my sins. I turn away. I ask you to put me back in a right relationship with you. Is that you? On the count of three, you're going to lift your hands up. You ready? One, two, three, go. Lift them up. I see those hands. Okay, you can put them down. Maybe you're here today and you say, Chris, you know what? I'm dealing with something that you didn't even talk about. But I need God to know where I am. And I need to make sure I give that to him. Every head eye, every eye closed. When I have people say, Chris, that's me, pray for me. Would you lift your hands? One, two, three, go. Hands going up. Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now for the ones that pray to receive you. I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to take the next step. And the next step is to tell somebody. Tell somebody what they did. God, for others here who need to come back to you, Father, I pray right now they confess their sins to you because you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I pray, God, you put them in a right relationship. And God, for others in here who are dealing with things that I didn't even talk about, but you know right where they are. You know exactly what their situation is. I pray, God, that right now you would help them to cast their cares upon you because you care for them. You make that invitation to us. Father, you said if anyone is thirsty, let us come to, him and come to you and drink. I pray, Father, that you would help them to fling themselves upon your mercy and your grace, God, to trust you implicitly. And God, for others here dealing with stuff that I don't even know about, I pray, God, you just speak to their hearts. God, as men, I pray, Lord, that we would never be flippant with the things of you. I pray that we would learn from the mistakes of other men and not go there. I pray, God, if we do make mistakes, we'd write a good chapter to our story today and repent. And, Father, I pray we would all find our spiritual purpose in life that we may glorify you. God, we love you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, look up here at me, guys. Let me tell you, if you prayed to receive Jesus, I'd love to talk with you at some point. Um, a lot of times, guys, um, a lot of times, um, a lot of times, guys, um, a lot of times,